Well, thank you very much for the introduction. Thank you for having me, and uh, welcome to everybody. Um, I think you're expecting me to answer the question, did Marian Rievsky invent the computer, or was it Alan Turing, or was it indeed somebody completely different? So um, we'll go through that, and just because I've been told that this is the most intelligent audience I'm ever going to speak to in the whole of my life, I thought I would throw in a few googly. So first of all, what we're going to do is we're going to do it in reverse chronological order because that's adequately contrarian. Um, and um, I thought w I should start by telling you that it's not quite 70 years today, but it's about two weeks, in about two weeks time. It will be the 400 year old sum will be 70 years old. And I thought you might, thought you might like this. It's a fitting, point to talk about the invention of computers because on the 11th of June 1949 the London Times broke this story about something called the mechanical brain which had been invented at the University of Manchester and the Times having found out about this thing picked up the phone to the uh, Royal Society Computing Laboratory at Manchester and unfortunately the professor was out they got this other guy somebody called Alan Turing. And he started waxing a bit lyrical about the computer. Bearing in mind this is a computer that had a memory size of 1,024 bits. Okay, so um, he started waxing lyrical about this machine and started talking about its ability to write sonnets and its ability to compete with human beings on equal terms when it came to thinking about thinking. Um, this picture is of Alan Turing on the right, and he's standing at the console of the Manchester Mark I computer, which had a little bit larger memory size. The, the Manchester Baby, uh, which ran the world's first program ever on a stored program electronic computer, had done, its, done that program run uh, about six months before. And what had happened in 1949 uh, in June was that they had solved a problem uh, of Mersenne n prime, so 2 to the power of n, where n is a prime number, minus 1. And the question is, is that also a prime number? And it was a nice problem for the computer, because when you put 2 to the power of n minus 1 into binary, it's 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, you know, so it's a great, easy problem for a very small computer to, to run to try and factorize that. So that was the 400-year-old sum, and it's 70 years old. It's the first public demo of a program being run anywhere in the world on an electronic computer. A nice point to start. So this is where I can start to go backwards in time. Where did that Manchester computer come from? Well, okay, so the received wisdom is that computers came from this paper written by Alan Turing in 1935, published in 1936. Uh, the famous paper on computable numbers, uh, which was mentored by his professor uh, at uh, Cambridge University, Max Newman. Max Newman, who, of course, uh, turned out to be Alan Turing's lifetime mentor and indeed the professor at the uh, Royal Society Computing Laboratory uh, in Manchester in subsequent years. And then, of course, the received wisdom is that John von Neumann at uh, the uh, Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton read Alan Turing's paper and then came up with the von Neumann architecture and the famous first draft of a report on the EDVAC, which set out the architecture of all uh, computers uh, known to man ever since. And, you know, I don't tell you that any of that is wrong, but I do tell you that the evolution of the computer that ran the 400-year-old uh, sum problem was slightly different. I mean, it had those, it had that parenthood, if you like, but that's a very theoretical parenthood. It's not an engineering parenthood. And I thought we might look at the engineering side of things, which has got a sort of slightly different uh, family tree. So here we are, that's the Royal Society uh, Laboratory. It's still there at Manchester. The doorway is modern, and it's got this blue plaque on it to Alan Turing. 
Um, in fact, most street corners, there's a Starbucks on one side and there's a plaque to Alan Turing on the other. These days you'll find that this is quite, quite a common phenomenon. And I thought you might like to have a look at the, the Manchester baby computer. And, and there's, apart from the fact that it fills an entire room and it looks like it's sort of cobbled together from leftover parts, and there's an element of truth in this, that it was cobbled together from leftover parts. Um, Newman had uh, asked the authorities at Bletchley Park in 1945, just after he was appointed to this post in Manchester, if he could take away components from uh, the now uh, redundant Colossus machines uh, that had been used for breaking Lorentz codes at, at Bletchley Park. And this letter on the left is him uh, asking uh, for, for these bits. And what he's really trying to get hold of is these very valuable valves. Um, the valves are at the heart of electronic machinery for, for computing. They're the forerunner of transistors. Um, and you can use them for, in particular, in the Colossus machine, which you can see on the right-hand side of this slide. Um, what they were being used for was counting and switching. And I think, I mean, one of you will correct me about this when we get to the Q&A, but I think that counting and switching is all you need for a computer. And having invented this kind of um, technology and putting it to use in Colossus, Colossus was basically doing a, a very hefty and very tedious process of comparing uh, two very long binary numbers. And uh, uh, this, this kind of high-speed electronic approach was, uh, was just what they needed. And it had been in uh, use from about mid-1943. And the clever thing that they were doing in Colossus was storing one of the binary numbers that needed to be compared electronically in a set of valves, which I think is, you know, I mean, that, that, was, that was the essence of its, it wasn't quite a stored program, but if you reconfigured Colossus, and the mathematicians at Bletchley Park were dead keen to do this, if you reconfigured the way that Colossus was being uh, wired up, you could actually get it to do long multiplication. So there was a, you know, the, the mathematicians were just desperately keen to get their hands on Colossus in downtime to play with it, and uh, Tommy Flowers and uh, Max Newman were not particularly enthusiastic about that because it was supposed to be there to break codes and win the war. <laughs> okay, so Max Newman gets his valves which are Colossus leftovers, which explains why the Manchester baby looks like it's cobbled together in a garage. But where does the Colossus itself come from? We, we keep asking the sort of, well, okay, you've peeled one layer off, what, what's, what's below it? So I think what we need to do is to go back to the predecessor machinery at Bletchley Park, and you might recognize this thing. This is the, this is the Turing Welshman bomb. This is also, uh, used for code breaking, and you'll know that this one is used in particular to find the settings on Enigma machines. And I don't need to tell this audience that code breaking Enigma, there are two problems. There's a hardware problem and a software problem. And the hardware problem is what's the machine and how is it wired up, how does it work? And the second problem is that if there's 150 million, million, million different ways to set up the machine every day, and that's just on a three-rotor machine using 10 plugs on the plug board, how do you know which of those settings the Germans are using to send their secret messages today, bearing in mind that on every network at midnight, they're going to change the settings and you have to start all over again. So that's the software problem. What the bomb was doing was solving the software problem. So that assumes that the hardware problem had already been solved. I'll come back to that in a minute. And it's not using valves. It's using 1939 technology as opposed to 1943 technology. Four years makes all the difference. This is using relays. So the switching system is using uh, electromechanical relays 
And just to give you a sense of the speed of the bomb, this is able to go through the 17,576 possible rotor settings of a three rotor Enigma in about between 10 and 12 minutes. So that gives you a sort of sense as to how fast it is. It's, compared with the computer, it's unbelievably slow. For 1939 purposes, it's pretty quick. I mean, you know, the idea that you can test all the settings in just over 10 minutes, that's pretty impressive. Okay. So, Colossus comes to some extent out of the bomb because we have people wondering about how to speed up the bomb, particularly when confronted with the four-rotor Enigma, which has to run, so the bomb for a four-rotor Enigma needs an extra set of rotors on it, it needs to run 26 times as fast in order to get through the extra 26 times settings. So how's it gonna do that? And they were starting to worry about whether relay technology could actually do the job fast enough. In fact, it turned out that it could, but at the same time, they're starting to think about maybe we can add an electronic unit onto the side of a bomb to deal with the very fast fourth rotor problem. And so using electronic components, again, it's for counting and switching, that started them thinking in about 1942 about the development of electronic technology as an adjunct to Enigma code breaking before they get on to doing the Colossus. So we can sort of see the parenthood becoming slightly clearer, but only slightly clearer because there's an unanswered question which I want to address in two minutes, which is, how did the Brits actually solve the hardware problem before they could get cracking on the bomb and the software problem? However, I need to do something just to excite you and get you on the edges of your chairs. So this is the, this is the moment of drama in this, in this talk because what we're going to do is talk about how the bomb works and uh, the job that it actually does. So first of all, and this is kind of like a little pause, and then I'm going to shift the talk and start, instead of going backwards in time, I'm gonna go forwards in time, but I don't want to confuse you with too much in one go. So this is like the half-time interval, if you like, where we pause and we do some, do some fun stuff. Okay, what's the bomb designed to do? First of all, what you're trying to do is to work out, as I explained before, the way that the Germans have set up their Enigma machine every day. And this piece of technology, the bomb, designed by Alan Turing and Gordon Welshman, who you can see in this, in this picture, what you're trying to do is to work out what three rotors have been chosen and in which slots they are, bearing in mind that by the beginning of World War II, the Germans had five possible rotors, so they've got a library of five rotors from which they're picking three, and they're putting them into the Enigma machine, so you can do the maths on how many permutations that is. Um, it's about 60, I reckon, what different ways of putting three rotors from a library of five into, into that machine, so you've got to work out that. You've got to work out what the starting position of each of the rotors is. There's 26 possible starting positions for each rotor. And you've also got to work out what the plug board cross pluggings are. There's 10 cross pluggings, 26 possible letters. And I think it's 26 factorial divided by six factorial two to the power of 10 or something. I may have got the, num the formula wrong, but it's a very, very large number. It's 150 followed by a huge string of noughts. And so you kind of, the plug board is like the really scary thing. So how does this clever bronze looking thing that I just showed you answer that problem? Well, what they did, is they started with a piece of intercepted text, like you might find the blue stripe across the top of the slide, and a guess at what the Germans had actually said in plain text German. Um, and for reasons which uh, 
only military intelligence people could actually explain, they decided to encipher the weather forecast. And they would use a helpful word to explain that this was the weather forecast message, like saying, this is the weather forecast. So they would have useful cribs, sort of, you know, guesses that you could easily identify. Like, we think this message might contain the word Vetter for Hair Saga, followed by an X to mark the space between that and the next, next word. So, and we all know that the enigma cannot encipher any letter as itself. So what we can do is slide Vetter for Hair Saga along the observed intercept, and whenever we find there's a what they call a crash, which is where the thing has apparently enciphered it as it, a letter as itself, as you can see in the top part of the slide, then uh, we know that can't be the correct position. But we can slide it along a bit further, and a bit further down, you can see that maybe three, four places further on, there's a possibility that Vetter for Hair Saga became uh, enciphered in the manner observed. That's the beginning of it. Now what we're going to try and do is to come up with a wiring diagram. And the way we'll construct a wiring diagram is by trying to find loops or cycles of letters throughout this crib and intercept. And if you look at the ones where I put green arrows on this, you'll find that you can actually construct an entire loop. You can do this in your spare time or you can take a picture of the slide and figure it out later. But you can get E, G, R, A, S and V to go around in a complete loop. That's different if you select different points in the message uh, for where E was uh, enciphered as G or G was the uh, uh, ciphertext for R and so forth. So having put those in a loop like we've done at the bottom of the slide there, what you're then going to do is to connect up a whole load of fake Enigma machines. And so you can see that on this clever device that uh, I have just invented, or rather got one of my ancestors to invent for me, um, uh, I've managed to construct a whole load of Enigma machines. So you can see them all sitting there in their neat little rows of three. And what I'm going to do is to connect these Enigma machines up into a circuit, electrical circuit, with 26 wire cables, uh, and each fake Enigma machine is going to test the possibility that E goes to G at position number eight, and G goes to R at position number nine, and, and so forth, with one Enigma machine devoted to that test of that particular position in the, in the message. And then what I need to do is just to set the thing to run and get it to run through all 17,576 possible settings. And the machine will stop when it's found a plausible start position from which you could have got all those encipherments with no illogical um, contradictions. And then the three little drums on the right-hand side of the machine will show what the machine considers is the possible, a logically possible start position for the three rotors. There's also a small device around the side where the machine will also tell you what it perceives to be one of the possible cross-pluggings. And with one cross-plugging, you can unpeel a whole lot. So this is what the bomb did. And the extraordinary thing about the bomb is that, contrary to what Hollywood may wish you to believe, um, the extraordinary thing about the bomb is that the design, Alan, Turing, Gordon, Alan Turing's original design, later modified by Welshman, Alan Turing's original design was in the hands of the engineers to get them to actually put this rather glorious device together. By late autumn, early winter, 1939, I know Hollywood has this sort of marvelous idea that it was much later in the war. It wasn't. Um, but the thing that is extraordinary about that is not that they were able to do the invention um, uh, so early in the war, but because at the very beginning of the war, or at least in July 1939, so just um, a few weeks before the war began, the British hadn't solved the hardware problem. 
They didn't know what the wiring of the interior of the Enigma machine was. If you don't know that, then you can build as many bombs as you like, but it's not going to get you anywhere. So there's this conundrum that you face, which is how did the Brits manage to get to the point where they were building bombs by the end of 1939, when in the midsummer of 1939, they still didn't know the uh, answer to the hardware problem. And this, this, just to illustrate this, this is a document from the National Archives. It's written in 1938 when the uh, Brits were starting to get alarmed about the poss possibility of another war with Germany and uh, knowing that the Enigma um, problem was what they needed to solve to find the way forward. Uh, it's probably quite difficult to read, um, but uh, what, it, what it says is, please can the French be asked um, to explain, if they can, uh, what the function of the strange device on the front of the machine is. And the strange device on the front of the machine is, of course, the plug board. Uh, and then they go on, and the next two pages ask questions like, well, what's the wiring between the keyboard and the entry plate where the electricity enters the three rotors? What's the wiring in the rotors themselves? These are unanswered questions at this, at this stage. Not only in 1938, but right up till, as I say, mid-July 1939. These questions were being asked by uh, Alistair Denniston, who was the head of the government Code and Cipher School, and his number one um, crypt analyst, uh, a chap called Dilly Knox. Dilly Knox was no greenhorn when it came to Enigma code breaking. During the Spanish Civil War, Knox had actually been breaking Enigma messages, but the thing was that the Enigma in question didn't have a plug board, and it had the interior wiring from the keyboard to the uh, entry plate for the rotors that was the same setup as on the commercially available machines and the Brits had gone out and bought one of these commercial machines in the mid 1920s so the, you know kind of we knew how the how the commercial machine worked but the trouble was that the German army and air force German armed forces version was definitely different they knew it was different they just didn't know how now there is an answer to this, which I'll come on to in just a second, but while we're on the sort of technical interlude, um, I wanted to introduce you to another machine, which is the predecessor of the bomb. This is the Bomba. This is a Polish machine, and the Polish machine was designed to do something called search for females, and um, there's an element of political incorrectness about this, which um, perhaps we uh, ought to gloss over, but the reason that the Poles were trying to invent a machine to search for females is that the word in Polish for females is very similar to the word in Polish for the same. So it's something like Samitsky and Samitska, but I don't speak Polish, so I, I may be wrong about that, the exact words, but what a female is, is it's all to do with how the Germans are explaining to each other how they're setting up their Enigma machines. So, okay, it's the beginning, it's five past midnight, and I've got to send the first message of the day. How am I going to tell the recipient of the message to set up his machine? Some things will be known in advance. So he'll have an info sheet that tells him that he's got to put these cross pluggings on the front of the machine. It'll tell him which rotors to use and in which positions to put the rotors. But that doesn't tell him how to set the rotors, which letter is uppermost on each of the three rotors. But frankly, if all that were known ahead of time, all it would require is somebody to do a battlefield capture of the info sheet. So some of the information about setup has got to remain secret. So, okay, so I've got a problem with this now because the recipient doesn't know how I've configured my three rotors, which letter is uppermost. So I've somehow got to tell him, and I could sort of just broadcast that. I could include that at the beginning of the message. But that would be a bit insecure as well. But there's a solution to this. I've got a cipher machine right in front of me, so I'm going to encipher the way that the three letters are set up. So what I will do is I will choose three letters, supposedly at random, 
tell the recipient what that is. I'll send that in clear text. But then using those three letters, I will encipher the actual message setting that I'm going to use. And then what the Germans were doing up until May of 1940 is they would do that twice over. And here's the flaw in their system. Because if they did it twice over, then I know that that message, I don't know what the message is, it's a three letter message. It might be ABC, or it might be HIT, or it might be QWE, because I'm lazy and I've just looked at the first three letters on the keyboard. But the, whatever it is, I've enciphered it twice over. And then sometimes you'd find this phenomenon where in the observed intercepted ciphertext, a letter would be the same. So Q would be, you know, if it was Q, then Q would be, uh, if you look at the second of the three examples, translated into S in both positions. And that gave enough for the Poles to come up with a logical test. It's very similar to the test on the bomb. Is there a position, is there a start position, one of those 17,576 start positions, where I could get what, some letter, I don't know what it is, to go to S at both positions one and position four of the uh, intercepted preamble to the message. So the poles were exploiting this. So the bomber, which you can see there, it looks a bit different from a bomb, but if you look at the sort of strange columns on the top of it, these are three piles of three Enigma rotors and there's a motor in the middle that drives them round all 17,000 odd possible positions. And it's looking for one where for two of these rotors, the first and the fourth letters are uh, as observed in these females. Uh, another two are looking for where the second letters are identical as observed in these females. And then the other, the final two are um, pairs of uh, uh, rotors are looking for the third and sixth positions. So that's what the bomber was doing. And it's actually the bomber that you can tell is the predecessor, the logical predecessor of the bomb. But how? So I'm now going to go forward in time. So we're in the second half of the football match now. I'm going to start with a meeting that took place in Paris in January of 1939. So the, what's happened here is that the French military intelligence services have called a three-country conference. They know that the Poles are threatened by Germany. They know that they have a military alliance with Germany, which, uh, sorry, Poles are threatened by Germany. The French know they have a military alliance with Poland, which will oblige the French to come to the Poles' support if Poland is attacked. They also know that the Brits, and in particular Knox, have been working on the um, whole uh, uh, Enigma problem. But they also know that the Brits don't seem to know the answers. And they're not sure whether the Poles know the answers or not. So they commission this, they convene this meeting that takes place in Paris with all three countries participating. Nobody reveals anything at this meeting. Everybody leaves the meeting as ignorant about Enigma as they were when they went in. But what has happened is that this has formalized an intelligence sharing partnership between the three countries, or rather the three countries' military intelligence services, and it's uh, encapsulated in this secret memo that the French wrote immediately after the meeting where they decide to give the participating services code names, or rather code letters, where X stands for Paris, Y stands for London, and Z stands for Warsaw. And it's also agreed that if anybody makes a breakthrough on this, basically this Enigma hardware problem, that they will summon another meeting of the three countries by sending a message that says something has come up, il y a du nouveau. By July, 
the Germans had taken over the entirety of uh, Czechoslovakia in breach of the Munich Agreement. They've uh, taken over a piece of Lithuania. They are not in the least bit ashamed of anything that they have done, and the Poles are very significantly threatened. It's now becoming very obvious that an invasion of Poland is imminent. It's only a matter of when. The Poles have also discovered that their bomber technology is not as effective as it used to be, the reason being that the Germans have turned their selection of rotors from being three Enigma rotors that you could choose, and it was just really a matter of which order you put them in the machine. They've now introduced these extra two, so there's this library of five from which three are chosen. For the bomber approach to Enigma setting finding to work, they needed not six, but 60 bombers. And they didn't have 60 bombers, they only had six. So they were hoping that they could perhaps reach out to the French to stiffen the military alliance and reach out to the Brits for technological help and building more of the uh, extra 54 bombers that they needed. Uh, and maybe the three countries working together could actually sort the Enigma problem out. So they sent out a telegram, Il y a du nouveau. And in the middle of July, the Brits and the French went to Warsaw. They had to cross Germany, which was uh, challenging in the middle of July 1939, but they, they got there. And despite the best efforts of uh, my friend Dilly Knox and his boss, Alistair Denniston, uh, Denniston managed to calm things down. But Knox, when confronted with the knowledge that the Poles had solved the Enigma problem, not just months, but actually years and years before. He threw all his toys out of the cot and nearly walked out of the meeting, which was um, not exactly um, in the spirit of cooperation and trying to find out the answers to these difficult problems. Anyway, somehow Denniston put the meeting back together and they came back to London with this list of discoveries that the Poles had made, which is, again, it's another document from the National Archives. It's in German, and I've highlighted one of them that says, Die Bomben. Uh, so what had happened is the Poles had not only shared the answer to the hardware problem, but they'd also shared the answers to the software problem as well. All their code-breaking techniques they had shared in course of a two-day meeting. So you can imagine how completely shocked and overwhelmed the Brits and the French were by what was effectively a priceless unilateral gift of uh, secret intelligence. So I'm now going to go backwards in time again. How on earth did the Poles get to this position of knowing quite what they did? And this is where it all gets quite interesting because the French come into the process uh, a second time. Um, I need to introduce you to Marian Rievsky, but first of all, I'd like to just explain that Marian Rievsky, when he did his amazing work, was equipped with a document which was the operating instructions for the German military Enigma machine. You've got the cover there and uh, a photograph of the Enigma machine that's actually in the operating instructions. Marian Rievsky got hold of these documents because the French had supplied them to Polish military intelligence in 1932. And they'd supplied them to the Poles in 1932 because they had got them from a German spy called Hans Tilo Schmidt. Hans Tilo Schmidt's a great guy. He was a World War I Iron Cross decorated veteran who needed money to fund his lifestyle. So what we're talking about is he liked brandy, uh, he liked girls, he liked nice suits, he liked nice holidays, he liked girls, um, he liked champagne. Uh, and actually then the whole girlfriend thing sort of became a bit of an addiction. So I mean, all this cost money. 
um, and his rather crummy job working in the Cypher Bureau um, wasn't really paying the big bucks that he needed. But of course, in the Cypher Bureau, with access to the safe, he could actually lift the documents, the secret documents, out of the safe at the weekends, and he could take them to the French who would photograph them and give them back, and then he could put them back in the safe by Monday morning. And Hans Thilo Schmidt made a very handsome living out of this. Starting in 1932, he didn't stop providing the French with uh, intelligence until well into World War II. So he was still providing them with intelligence in 1940, including news about how the Germans were going to invade France and so forth. So Hans Thilo Schmidt is the most extraordinary guy. But Marian Rievsky, being in the Polish Cypher Bureau, had got hold through this route of the operating instructions, not wiring diagrams, mind you, operating instructions for the German military Enigma machine. And armed with that, an old commercial Enigma machine with the wrong wiring and no plug board, and a pile of intercepted messages he was able to construct permutation equations which he could then solve to reverse engineer the Enigma machine. And I think this is one of probably three most astonishing code-breaking achievements of the 20th century, to be able to reconstruct the wiring of a machine through pure mathematical analysis. And Ryevsky, uh, together with uh, three other colleagues who I think deserve mention as well, not only constructed, reconstructed the German military Enigma machine, which they'd never actually seen other than in this photograph, um, but they were also able to start working on the software problem about how the Germans were setting their uh, machines up every day. So uh, there were two other mathematics graduates from Poznan University who were a couple of years behind Ryevsky, uh, Jerzy Rzycki and Henrik Zygalski, um, shown here left and middle of the slide. Each of them came up with um, uh, code-breaking techniques. Uh, Rzycki, I think more electromechanically minded, was focusing on machines to break machines. Zygalski came up with a perforated sheets method which turned out to actually be more useful than the machines, and particularly in 1940. Uh, Zygalski's perforated sheets method, very difficult to do, but um, uh, his method was actually being used by all three countries, X, Y, and Z, uh, during, during the um, period between Christmas 1939 and um, the fall of France. The other guy who never gets a mention, I don't really understand why this is, but this is uh, Anthony Pallet. He is, he's not only a code breaker, he's the first Polish guy to have had a go at the, uh, at the Enigma problem in the 1920s. Um, but he's also an engineer, and so he's the one that is behind the Polish uh, fake Enigma machines, because they didn't have any Enigma machines, but to do decoding, you need to have machines. So they made their own uh, effectively reconstructed Enigmas, which don't look quite the same as um, proper German ones. So he, he puts together fake Enigma machines. He puts together this machine I've got here under Rzycki's picture, which is a thing called a cyclometer. Again, it's a primitive device for finding females. Uh, uh, and he, he is the man who, who designed the uh, electrical components of the, of the bomber. Um, so I think you now get the sense why I called this talk, did Marian Rievsky invent the computer? Well, the answer is no, of course he didn't. But what we've done is traced back from Newman's computer in the Manchester lab, which was running, running programs in 1949, right down to the great-grandfather of that machine, which is the Polish bomber, 
which is directly the brainchild of Marian Rievsky and his permutation equations um, and that astonishing feat of uh, reverse engineering in 1932. That is, uh, as Sir Alan was saying, the subject matter of my latest book, which is called X, Y, and Z, The Real Story of How Enigma Was Broken. Uh, putting together, if you like, the prequel to the Bletchley Park story. And one of the things that fascinated me when I was looking into this, I mean, I've got these guys, but what happened to them? What, what happened to them when World War II started? You never hear about them being at Bletchley Park. And so I looked into this, and it turns out to sort of be uh, a very interesting set of human stories in, in its own right. The Polish codebreakers were forced to leave Poland in 1939 after um, their country had been invaded not just by the Germans but also by the Soviet Union. And they ended up in France working for Gustave Bertrand, the uh, head of the French cipher bureau with whom they'd had all these dealings over the years in particular, um, acquiring those uh, famous Enigma documents um, in 1932. So they were working for him uh, just outside Paris in the uh, Chateau de Vignoles, which you can see here, it's rather, it doesn't exist anymore, or elegant looking uh, building. Uh, and they had a teleprinter link to Bletchley Park. So they were able to effectively trade Enigma settings as they found them. Um, the Poles, the French, and the Brits all working together still in that triangular partnership uh, right up until the time when the Poles had to escape from France because of yet another German invasion. At that point, they go to North Africa and you can see that they have some fun in North Africa. There are girlfriends, which um, uh, some of them quite elegantly dressed girlfriends, as you can see. Uh, and um, after that, they find themselves working once again for Gustave Bertrand uh, in France, this time in the unoccupied zone of the south of France. Um, and they are running effectively a clandestine code breaking operation. They're still looking at German codes, even though they're actually being somehow sheltered by the Vichy government. It's the most peculiar, um, really difficult to understand arrangement. And that lasted until the end of 1942, at which point the Germans had decided that they were going to occupy the free zone of France. And also they had uncovered documents in Warsaw when they occupied the city, which indicated that the Poles had broken Enigma before the outbreak of the war. So the names of the Polish codebreakers appear in German uh, wanted lists, police wanted lists, uh, such as the one on the right-hand side of the slide. Fortunately, they didn't manage to get them on, and they were mug shots to go with this wanted list as well, so they knew who they were looking out for. And they were all, all these guys, Ryevsky, Ruzitsky, Zygowski, Palutz, are all on the wanted list. Fortunately, the wanted lists were a bit late in coming, and so this one, which I think is the first in the series, is dated March 1943, by which time the Germans have occupied the so-called Zone Libre of France, and the Poles have tried to escape. Of the four Poles that I've talked to you about, Palut died at Sachsenhausen, when the Allies decided to bomb the Heinkel factory in which the Sassenhausen workers uh, were put, forced to work. Uh, and this bomb was dropped in the last week of the war in Europe and it killed Pallet and so he didn't survive. Uh, Ruzitsky didn't survive either. He was uh, shipwrecked in uh, January 1942 um, and uh, Rather curiously, there is actually a photograph, a contemporary photograph of the ship sinking. So um, it's the one towards the left of that picture. It's a very fuzzy photo, but um, the idea that somebody's actually taking a photo of the shipwreck is astonishing in its own right. So Rzhitsky drowned. He, he didn't make it. Uh, the other two, uh, Ryevsky, bottom left, and Zygalski, 
Uh, both made it back to Britain, uh, arriving in the summer of 1943, where they were put to work by Polish military intelligence to break codes. And when it was obvious that they were wasting their time breaking German codes, because effectively Betsy Park had got pretty much a monopoly on that by that stage, um, the task they were put to is monitoring the Russians. As, I, as you'll remember, Poland had been invaded by Russia uh, in 1939, and then the Germans had swept the Russians back into uh, Russia, but Russia still wanted to keep, or well, Soviets still wanted to keep their hands on the eastern part of Poland, and so the relations between Poland and, and the Soviet Union were extremely fraught, and so even though Churchill was cuddling up to Stalin, that didn't mean that the Poles were particularly enthusiastic to do that. So these two guys were put on Russian code breaking, uh, which of course, after the Soviets had basically taken over Poland as a puppet state in 1945, made it almost unimaginably dangerous for any of the Polish code breakers to return home after the war. Zygowski is pictured here in uh, probably in the 1960s, looking a bit like a film star. Uh, he stayed on in the UK and became a mathematics professor. Um, and Rievsky, you can see here sitting reading a book in the, uh, when he was in the south of France. Uh, Rievsky did go back to Poland. He's probably the only one of the Polish co-breakers who actually went back to Poland and braved the Soviet threat. He was investigated by the Polish secret police uh, on several occasions between his return there and 1956, where effectively they dropped the case against him. He was doing this really boring accounting kind of job, which for somebody who's, who's as brilliant a mathematician as Rievsky was a deliberate ploy to sort of keep him below the radar. And uh, they decided that he was too gray a character to be of interest. It was actually Rievsky, not only doing this extraordinary thing where he was braving the rest to go back to Poland, but it's Rievsky who first wrote about the Enigma story in the 1960s, and that was picked up by a Polish historian who then broke the news on their side of the Iron Curtain, and then it finally trickled through to our side of the Iron Curtain in the early 1970s, leading to the disclosure uh, in, in Britain in a book called The uh, Ultra Secret written by a guy called Winterbottom, which is full of mistakes because he did it from memory and without adequate knowledge, um, but never mind. Uh, and then suddenly the dam had burst and the story about Bletchley Park and Enigma was uh, all out and known by everybody. So Rievsky's a very interesting character once you once you get to know him a bit better he's a little bit more than permutation equations but anyway there we are so that's the story of x y and z and how it fits into the question about the invention of the computer thank you very much for listening Good evening, um, my name is Rebecca Arrio and I'm the marketing manager at G Research and will be facilitating the Q&A. So, um, lots of questions. So, the first one. Given Britain's leading role in computing in the 40s and 50s, why don't we have a Google or Microsoft or equivalent? <laughs> the only people I can blame are sat here. <laughs> Um, no, it's a, it's a very interesting question. Um, I think part of the answer, I don't, I don't claim to have the complete answer, but I think that part of the answer is that the Brits had always hidden their leading status in the computer industry, or at least in terms of computer innovation, um, behind the Official Secrets Act. Nobody was allowed to know about Colossus until much later than the uh, 
Enigma code-breaking story broke. So the full details about what Colossus had been, what it was for, how it was engineered, came out much, much later than the uh, Ultra Secret. So uh, the beginnings of it were um, revealed by uh, a computer science historian um, from Newcastle University in the late 1970s, early 1980s, but there was really very little to go on. And people who worked at Bletchley Park were not allowed to talk about it. Tommy Flowers was not allowed to explain that his designs for post-war computing machines were known and already proven to have worked because he'd actually tried them out on Colossus. So he had to sort of like reinvent wheels um, in, the, in the late 40s and early 50s. And this was a typical sort of experience. So, I mean, uh, the, and the full detail of Colossus really wasn't known until 1990s. I mean, unbelievab unbelievably sort of recent compared with this. So whereas I think in America where they'd done similar kind of work and again for military purposes but the clothing of secrecy didn't quite um, cause it to be total silence on, on their technological achievements so uh, that but I'm afraid that is a story about hardware and you asked about Google and Microsoft which are um, more uh, questions about innovation in the software space and uh, uh, that I really don't know but there's there's lots of interesting books about that but it's probably I, I suspect that again the parentage of this probably doesn't come out of places like Bletchley Park but uh, um, yeah thank you okay uh, the next question is how fast or powerful was Manchester Mark one compared to a modern computer um, or GR calc farm? Uh, um, very good. So um, the Manchester Mark I was actually a pretty whizzy computer for 1950. But uh, I mean we talk about the length of time it was taking the Mark I to run fairly simple routines um, uh, where not talking in terms of megahertz for um, this this kind of machine, but I, I I don't have the don't have the technical specifications. If you want to know about this stuff, there's a very good book by uh, Professor Simon Lavington, which talks about the early Manchester computers, and it's got all the technical stuff in it, um, and and it's got um, it's got stuff that I love. It's got lots of photographs in it, which I mean it, you know gives you a real sense of what these what these machines were like. Um, filled an entire room, I mean, probably about half the size of this stage. Uh, but the great thing about the Mark I is that it looked it look really space age because they put all the, uh, all the engineering was behind these sort of shiny metal cupboards. And so you had this sort of like very neat console. I mean, it's most extraordinary looking thing. It looks, uh, it actually looks really boring to look at. It just looks like a piece of office kit, um, which I guess is probably what the manufacturers were trying to aim at. But yeah, you wouldn't be able to run anything on it. I mean, you know, uh, the, no, there's a little story about it. Sorry, if you'll excuse me. If you go to the Science Museum, they've got the Pilot Ace. It's the pilot model of Alan Turing's automatic computing engine, uh, which is slightly more modern than the Manchester Mark I. It's about a 1950 machine. Um, and on its console, there's a little telephone dial, you know, one of those, like on an old-fashioned phone. And apparently visitors to the Science Museum say, is that how you got the internet in 1950? <laughs> well, apparently the reason it's called telephone dial is it was for data input. You could, you could actually use the dial to put numbers in faster than keying them in. So, so <laughs> okay, next question. Um, how about Babbage and Lovelace's computer? Wasn't pre wasn't it the first? Well, I don't think it was ever built. If anybody can uh, tell me, the, the difference engine um, was, or at least th there was a mock-up difference engine. It was a half-size model that Babbage built. Um, there's a full-size difference engine uh, 
at the Science Museum. Again, this is this is built to Babbage's design by uh, the curator there, Doron Swade, who's written books about this stuff. Um, but I think the analytical engine, which is the one that was the fully programmable thing, uh, there's still a big controversy um, amongst the engineers who understand about this stuff about whether the uh, technology available at the time, when, when you're thinking about the, the ability to precision cut gear wheels and, and um, have all these interlocking mechanical parts, whether it would actually have worked or whether it would have jammed, whether it would have broken down, whether it would actually been feasible. Um, I think in terms of the actual design, I think from what I understand, people believe that actually the design was capable of doing the, uh, on an intellectual level, capable of doing, doing the complicated programming tasks that um, uh, Ada Lovelace um, advocated. And whether she's this is all very difficult, but she was the great she was the great promoter. So she understood the capabilities of the thing, and so she gets sort of um, this plaudit for being the sort of the world's first computer programmer. And she's a woman, which is sort of like kind of great news. Uh, there's a it, it's the story is actually a little more complicated than that. She needed to master the subject because she was Babbage's sort of great PR person. She was promoting his promoting his projects and so I was trying to explain how you know, if you stretch the capabilities of the machine it could do all this exciting stuff so um, did she program it well it's sort of a kind of a bit like Alan Turing programming writing programs for the ace when the ace was 10 years away from being built you know it's kind of maybe but you know I'm, I'm, I think it's anyway but she's a, she's a great character too so I'm not I'm not going to Diss her in this. <laughs> okay, this is a long question, so um, bear with me. Historically, huge leaps in technological technological achievement have been made during wartime. From the viewpoint of both a historian with an understanding of the past and a geneticist with knowledge of the drive of human progress, um, do you give any credence to the idea that we, um, as a society, not necessarily academics? do our best work when we are trying to kill each other. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'd put it the other way around. I'd say that we probably do our best work when we are threatened by those who might be trying to kill us. And so if you look at the code-breaking technology, for example, I think, that, I think you'd regard that as defensive rather than aggressive. Um, but that's not to deny the other half of it. So if you look at where were the Germans massively ahead of the Allies in technological development, I mean, you know, rocket science, is rocket science is German science, and uh, I think they were trying to kill us with, with, with that, but we never got to the moon without that. So I think, um, I think there's obviously something in it. It's probably summed up in necessity being the mother of invention, but then you can take two sides on the question of what's necessary. Yeah. Um, no, we've managed to invent loads of things outside wartime, haven't we? So I think while technological progress can be seriously driven by war, getting hold of grant money is not that difficult in wartime. Um, then uh, I don't think we should say that all progress depends on our innate wish to destroy each other. Let's hope so, anyway. Um, another question. Uh, what did the Allies use to encode their military messages? Was Fletchley Park involved in creating more secure encryption? Okay, so... The development of machine... Uh, ciphers happened just after World War One, with um, the Enigma machine being the sort of, um, if you like, the iconic example of um, rotor-based electromechanical encipherment uh, technology. The Brits got hold, as I explained earlier, of a commercial Enigma machine when it came onto the market in the mid-1920s, and in fact most uh, armed forces were looking at 
Enigma as being a possible way that they might uh, um, uh, send each other secure messages. The Brits decided they didn't like the look of Enigma. Um, they put a code breaker called Hugh Foss onto the problem and uh, Foss said, no, this is too easy to break, as proved by Dilly Knox 10 years later in the Spanish Civil War. But what they did do is they took, took the ideas and liberally reused, maybe I should use the word stole, the uh, intellectual property and uh, turned it into something called the Typex machine, which effectively was a, a multi-rotor uh, Enigma machine variant with a plug board and with various other bells and whistles, which was a lot more secure than uh, Enigma. And they used that during the war for their machine uh, encipherment. Was that developed at Bletchley Park? No, it wasn't. But Bletchley Park was responsible for the development of non-machine ciphers being used uh, successfully during World War II. Um, and in particular, there was a bunch of people who were turning out one-time one time pads, if you want me to explain what they are, then I will happily do that. And they were using Hollerith machinery to generate random sequences for one-time pads. And they were also developing uh, a, f a field cipher, which was based on a stencil where you sort of look through windows in a in a cardboard sheet to work out what what um, uh, elements of the uh, code book you're actually going to use to encipher a message and that uh, these these things were known about by the Germans but were never broken by them so they were ultimately pretty secure so yes Bletch Park did have a code making as well as a code breaking uh, capacity but not on machines what are your thoughts on the persecution Ellen Turing faced for being gay? Okay, I'm glad, glad this question got asked because um, it's an opportunity for me to do some demythification. If you've seen the movie and you know which one I'm talking about, then you'll have this picture of this sort of broken person who's suffering from some very severe form of mental illness um, who's barely capable of sort of getting up in the morning and making his own breakfast. I put it to you that that could not be further th from the truth. So, I don't want to say that what happened to Alan Turing in 1952 and the uh, so-called treatment that he received at the hands of the psychiatric profession um, was a good thing. And in fact, I think it was an unmitigated disaster. But from his own mental health perspective, I think the interesting thing I discovered when I was looking into this is that he was over this problem. By 1953, he was, he'd had the hormone implant taken out and he was back to normal. And as far as I can work out from the very limited amount of correspondence that survives from this period, he was pretty well adjusted then. So we have to look elsewhere for the causes of his suicide. Um, and I, I find, this, find this actually hard to get my head around, but I would suggest that it's a combination of two things. I've had long conversations with Andrew Hodges, who's uh, uh, Alan Turing's first and, and most sort of knowledgeable biographer about um, who's actually interviewed far more of the people that knew him than, than I was able to. So Andrew is Andrew's very knowledgeable about this. But he, his theory about this is that um, Alan Turing always wanted to control not just his life, but the ending of his life. Um, and that's a privilege that society doesn't really allow us. We're expected to have it happen to us, but Andrew's theory is that Alan would denied that and said that he, he would go when he wanted to go and he would control that. Uh, I, don't, I don't disagree with that, by the way. Um, but the other thing is, I think if you're looking for an immediate cause, then I believe that there was some boyfriend trouble at the time. Um, there's, there is some evidence for that 
um, Andrew and I probably disagree slightly on how to interpret it, but uh, um, but so I I think you've got this. The movie paints this sort of terrible and actually completely false picture of this sort of broken man, which is just just not right. I mean, you look at his engagement diary, you look at these correspondence file that was recently turned up at Manchester University 18 months ago, which charts all these just his. I mean, it's like looking at his email inbox for the last three years of his life, and it's really, really interesting. Um, and the, you know, it just doesn't support this this broken man theory at all. And so I, I reject that utterly. This is this is a guy who was in control, um, and I think he retained control right through to the end. Um, let's just look at what happened when he was tried. Okay, he's not. He's not broken down in the witness box. He's standing up there and completely contrary to the legal advice that he's getting, he's saying, I haven't done anything wrong. I don't see the need to defend what I have done. I mean, he's actually defiant about this whole thing. They have to sort of like try and get him to calm down because otherwise he was going to be sent to prison. He'd lose his job, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, getting, him, getting him to play the game according to you know, what was in his best interests was not, not, not an easy job. So... Uh, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm afraid I've got a very different mental picture of Anna Turing, which is built built around what the witnesses that I spoke to told me about what he was like to work with. I don't mean he was easy all the time. I mean, many of us have worked with professors, and we know that they can be difficult from time to time. And I think he was probably on the difficult end of the difficult range. But that's uh, but that doesn't mean he's got no sense of humour. It doesn't mean that you can't go down the pub as long as you want to talk to him about stuff that he wants to talk to him about, which is probably not girls and football, then uh, you know it's going to be it's going to be fine. And uh, I, so um, yeah, I, I I just have this completely different picture of him from. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. I don't, again, I don't want people to think that I uh, disrate Benedict Cumberbatch as an actor. I think we thought he thought he acted the part he was asked to play brilliantly, but. That script, which won an Oscar, the only f Oscar that film won was actually for the script, and it's the script that's at the root of all the problems. <laughs> so there we are. <laughs> um, why do you think the crucial role of the Poles in the wartime cold breaking effort has not been widely acknowledged until until now um, outside of Poland? Now this is this is a very good question, and I. Uh, well, I don't know. I've got a, I've got a theory. So, if anybody disagrees with this, come and talk to me afterwards about it. But um, I think the problem was because, again, it's all wrapped in this sort of official secrets act um, clothing. But in about 1979, Sir Harry Hinesley issued the first volume of the official history of British intelligence in the Second World War. Appendix 1 talks about Enigma. And in 1979, there was very, very limited data available about how Enigma had been broken. Hinesley himself hadn't worked on the problem. Uh, and so he was relying on other people's testimony to wrote what, write what was written in Appendix 1. And it and it said that the Poles had stolen an Enigma machine and uh, that they had, I mean, there were various other factual inaccuracies about it. And it basically gave all the credit to the code breakers at Bletchley Park, very much downplaying the contribution and in particular not even mentioning this meeting that took place in July 1939, which is obviously crucial for the whole, whole story. Um, Clearly, when that story came out, the Poles felt that not only slighted by this, but uh, um, sort of very keen to set the record straight. Um, but I think the problem, the problem being that the first thing, first story out there tends to be the one that sticks. And so for like 40 years now, <laughs> we've been trying to uh, claw back the misstatements that are in Appendix 1. So Volume 3 of the Official History has a, 
uh, a revised appendix which Marion Rievsky had signed off on that sort of says, terribly sorry, we've got it all wrong. Forget appendix one, appendix 30, whatever it is, 37, I think it is, um, now says the, what the correct story is. But it's kind of too late by then, and it's got... It's got into the public consciousness that Bletchley Park did this amazing Enigma thing, and that the polls they'd just stolen an Enigma machine, and you know that was kind of uh, that was their contribution, and it's just it's just so wrong. And um, I think one of the good things about looking at it with our perspective that we have now is that Bletchley Park's firmly on the map; doesn't have to prove itself anymore. And actually, people have become very very interested in the whole Bletchley Park and Alan Turing stories. I think largely it is a, one of the positive offshoots of a certain movie that I was being very rude about five minutes ago. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm mixed feelings about it. But um, you know, that's good that people have got excited about this story and want to know more and more about it. And uh, and that means that actually the people are open-minded about it as well. They're actually now quite receptive. And I found particularly interesting that in Britain, people are very receptive to the idea that the Poles had actually done something that was of crucial importance to the Bletchley Park effort. So, you know, um, it, re it really isn't a case of uh, having to overcome resistance in Britain to the idea that the Poles had done it. And it's just that there's this sort of nasty scar that we created with this badly... Um, researched Appendix 1. Uh, again, I don't want to blame Hinesley for it because at the time the information that was available to him was very limited and, uh, and in particular the people who had worked on the Enigma problem in the 1930s and the people who'd worked on it in the early days of Bletchley Park were all dead. So there was nobody who was able to give that eyewitness testimony that he was so dependent on uh, to, I mean, Rievsky was still alive, but, uh, you know, he was like on the other side of the Iron Curtain, so what, 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 what could he contribute? So, you know, I think, uh, I, I think it's, a, it's just a sort of a lesson for historians that, you know, you might, you might be wrong because what you've got is only, you know, just a tiny segment of a much bigger story. Um, what were the um, other two great cryptography breakthroughs in the ah, 20th century? Well, okay, so well, that, was a bit, that was a bit of a teaser, that, that remark, wasn't it? Um, I, I think that the breaking by John Tiltman and Bill Tutt of the Lorentz machine, again, you've got a, this is a machine that um, uh, enciphers uh, Baudo code, so that's, f that's uh, four binary digit um, binary code, so you've got 32 alphabetical characters that you can uh, encipher using using this code. And what the Lorentz machine did was changed uh, ones into zeros or zeros into ones or left them alone um, uh, according to the cipher sequence that was put on. And again, it was a rotor-based device. Uh, it was a very complex rotor-based device with 10, 10, no, 12 rotors in it. Um, and based entirely on intercepts and nothing else. They didn't have any operating instructions or anything else. They had no idea what the Lorentz machine looked like or what it did. Tiltman and Tut, and in particular Tut, managed to reverse engineer the Lorentz machine. A quite astonishing achievement. That was done in 1942. And the other one is Frank Rowlett's um, reverse engineering of the Japanese purple machine in 1938, I think it was. Um, and I know less about that because I don't really, um, I don't wish to, again, belittle the American achievement. I'm just much less uh, well informed about it. I don't really understand how the purple machine works, so I can't really explain how he did it. But uh, it's the same. it was the same idea. Just using pencil and paper methods with never having seen the machine, being able to reconstruct how it works. And I find, I find these things just unimaginably uh, impressive uh, in terms of uh, uh, code-breaking uh, achievement. So a uh, final question. Um, does anything annoy you about, the current, about current society's approach to technology and use of the computer, e.g. the use of Facebook to <laughs> allegedly <laughs> influence Trump's election? Yes. <laughs> um, okay. L 
let's, I mean, we've all got opinions about social media and their ability to sort of manipulate, um, what do we call it, wetware. Um, uh, and and that's, a, that's a whole interesting debate in, it, in its own right. We could be here for another hour talking about that. I think actually the answer that I'd like to give to this question is more to do with uh, research funding and uh, unconscious bias in how we publish scientific research, how we fund scientific research, and who gets rewarded and what they get rewarded for. And I'm more nervous about this because we don't really debate this very often and it's more insidious. We're all aware of the social media sort of issue and therefore we talk about it a lot and we're conscious of it and we try and take steps, some of us, to um, uh, you know, combat it. But some kinds of research won't get public funding. Some kinds of research will get public funding and then there's a sort of... Uh, uh, like begets like kind of spiral that you get there so that r funding can tend to agglomerate into places where it might not actually be needed. Um, and then there's a, there's a whole load of editorial or quasi-editorial questions that never get asked about why papers get published. And people say, well, we have peer review and so it's kind of fine and, you know, everything that gets published is, is okay, which may be true. I don't, don't particularly deny that, but what about the stuff that never goes out for peer review because it's considered to be too weird or too off mainstream or too unorthodox to, uh, or, or even, uh, and this is probably less true in technological arena than it is in maybe pharmaceutical or um, other kinds of research where somebody wants to publish some perfectly valid negative results, this doesn't work. It's like, it's no different from what gets published in a daily newspaper. If it's a, if it's a positive story, you know, something actually happened, it'll get, I mean, it may not be a nice thing that happened, but if something happened, it'll get published. If you, I've only once can recall a, n a negative news story on the BBC which is after the Grenfell Tower disaster, and the BBC decided to report that Theresa May did not go and talk to the victims. Now, you may have your own political opinions about why that is, but that's very interesting, because I can't recall any other occasions when the BBC took an editorial decision to talk about something that did not happen. Now, in the world of scientific research, there's valid results about stuff that did not happen, that deserve to be published all the time. But somebody takes a decision that it's sexier to report something that did happen, that something did work. Uh, and that, again, introduces a whole load of bias and it reflects the where the funding is going to go next time. So somebody who's reported something very minor that did work is going to get another grant next time, whereas somebody who's done some really good stuff over here, but actually is proving that things don't work, uh, never got published, never got reft, never got any funding. And, uh, and I, I worry about that. And maybe you'll tell me that this isn't a problem in the technological research space. But I, um, I think unless we ask ourselves about fairness uh, and publication and grant allocation, then uh, we, you know, we need to perhaps you know, look, at, look at this, think about it, think about it intelligently. There we are. That's not the Facebook answer that you had hoped for, but uh, you all know the answer to that one anyway. <laughs> Thank you. So that concludes today's uh, lecture. Um, a round of applause for Sir Dermot Jury. <laughs> so on behalf of the Alan Turing Institute and G Research, we thank you all for coming tonight. Please do make your way up to the foyer for drinks and canapes. Um, Dermot will be joining you um, in the reception area as well um, in a few moments. Thank you so much. <laughs>